Behold, the 2020 Apple Silicon M1 chip MacBook Pro 13 inch, 16 gigs of RAM, one terabyte of storage. So no doubt this is probably the hundredth video you've watched regarding the M1 Max. I did the exact same thing uh, before I picked this one up on the strength of reviews by folks like Renee Ritchie, just in terms of general computing everyday use. For me, this replaces a 2014 MacBook Pro, which was definitely starting to show its age. Um, I don't use my laptop all that often for music production. With that being said, one of the first things I did with this was to install Final Cut Pro and uh, put some drone footage on there and started editing a little bit 4K. And it cut through that like Velveeta. It basically showed no signs that it was doing anything while it was perfectly playing back and editing and color grading all of that footage in real time. So I started thinking to myself, well, what could this thing do in audio land? Now, of course, there's a few caveats here. A lot of the third party plugins haven't been updated. There's a lot of videos out there. Some of them address this exact thing. And so far, everything I've seen is that most plugins, aside from native instruments, have been running under Rosetta 2 very smoothly. I'm gonna stick to Logic and the native plugins. I'm gonna kind of go through and show you guys the stress test that I did. I shared it with a couple of my bandmates and they said, you should post that. People could use that info. So here we go. It's worth mentioning that I'm gonna do this first part with the recommended and automatic and default processing threads pref, uh, which shows us four cores. The four cores that we see in these processing threads are the four high performance cores. Okay, first of all, big shout out to GBR Music. Uh, unfortunately, I can't play any of this back because it's all copywritten, but GBR Music, if you head over to his YouTube page, and I will link that in the description, created this remake of the Avengers theme in Logic and has been kind enough to uh, make that available for download. So go check that out. You can download his original session and then you can tweak it out to your heart's content, which is what I did here to basically uh, create the stress test. So let me go through and show you what I've got going on here. Okay, so the first 31 tracks are his stereo stems, his stereo orchestral stems for the session, and they sound great. Wish I could play them. Each one of those tracks has a stereo EQ and a stereo compressor inserted on the track itself. So basically channels 32 through, I believe, 67 are samplers, all stereo samplers, all have a stereo channel EQ inserted on them. And so these are all RAM intensive spooling their audio into RAM so it can play back in real time. Uh, it's just gobbledygook. I, I programmed a nonstop gobbledygook on all those tracks. You can see these MIDI regions uh, that I created on all of these. It's just nonsense that we won't listen to, but as you can see, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty dense. So moving along, uh, channel 68 through 83, those are all instances of alchemy with different patches. And the way I understand it is alchemy is kind of a hybrid. So there's sample information being loaded and it's also synthesis. Uh, and there's also processing on these patches. It's very unscientific in terms of uh, how the patches were chosen just at random. But you have 12 instances of alchemy going. So then for fun, I duplicated all of GBR's stems on uh, another 31 tracks and for the vast majority of them, I guess I forgot a few, but for the vast majority, I chopped them all up as you can see there and rearranged them uh, just to give some edit density. That's typically something that I'd have in a session. And all of this is at 44.1, 24 bit. My track count is 110 tracks total, plus a couple of aux ins where he has some space designers going on. I've got an adaptive limiter on the master. So every session is different, obviously, and one stress test isn't gonna provide all the information you might need for what you do. But this is a pretty heavy session in terms of what the processor would need to do. In terms of RAM, all of these sampler instruments, plus all of the Alchemy instances, there's no way that my 2014 MacBook could run a session a quarter this size. So uh, we'll see what happens. I'm just gonna start this thing looping here. It's running with one of the cores starting to peak out around 75%, well, about 70% maybe. Uh, but more specifically, if we open up Activity Monitor, let me zoom in here for you guys. 
We're hitting it just below 20%. And I've got activity monitor going. And as you can see, there's a bunch of other things running in the background. Uh, Adobe uh, Cloud is doing its thing, which probably isn't perfect for uh, a machine that you're dedicating to audio. But since I use this for video editing, it's just a reality. So with all that stuff happening right now, Logic looks like it's using close to a, a full core. 20% usage with Logic running that session with activity monitor on and running with all the Adobe stuff happening. Uh, and everything else is happening in the background. And then let's check in on our memory. So with Logic running this session, Activity Monitor running in the background, well, in the foreground right now, and all these other background tasks being handled uh, like Adobe, you can see that my memory usage is just under, well, just, just hit 10 gigs. Logic is using 2.74 gigs. You can look down the list and see these other things are you know, fairly marginal in and of themselves, but they, they, they start to tally up. So if this was my dedicated audio machine, I would just kill as many of these tasks as I could safely and, uh, and allocate all these resources to Logic. So now, just really quickly, I'm going to switch over to all eight cores. And it tells you there are four high-performance cores. The rest are efficiency cores. I don't know how that's going to really play out. Uh, it's the first time we've had it, so I'm sure we'll have lots of anecdotal evidence to uh, to compare and contrast. So when I have all these things engaged, you can see that now we have eight uh, processing threads show up. Let's see what happens when we start the session now. So we got a peak on one of those, almost up to 75% thereabouts. But now everything's running well below the 50% mark. Uh, let's see if we have activity monitor telling us what's going on. It's telling us that CPU usage, uh, it's reading quite a bit differently than when we had the four, uh, the recommended settings, which were the four performance cores, 127.2% of CPU. Now, of course, that's likely not uh, two performance cores. It's likely spread across, just jumped up to 140. Uh, I don't know how this translates. Maybe some of my uh, Uber nerds out there can can give us a window into how that translates. It's in, it's very interesting uh, that that the hit across all of them seems to be. Oh, and we got an overload. Interesting. I guess that happened when we opened up Activity Monitor, and maybe that's the point of the recommended settings: is that the computer is always going to be handling a bunch of tasks. It's kind of a it's a new dawn. I'm used to setting the uh, thread count as high as I can set it and uh, and go into town, but maybe that's not the thing to do anymore. So anyway, there we are. Interesting, interesting stuff. So now let me take this session, the same session, and load it up on the Mac Mini, 64 gigs of RAM, six core i7, and we'll see what kind of a RAM and CPU hit this session has on that machine. All right, so we are here on the Mac Mini and uh, as you can see on this performance meter from within Logic, we have, uh, we're hovering around 50%, all the threads, and some spikes up to 75%. A few times I've seen it go over 75%. So let's go over to Activity Monitor and see what our overall usage is. It's telling me that I'm using 160.9% of a CPU. So that's per core, I believe. So almost uh it's peaking out around 170 a little over 170 so so getting close to two cores and full disclosure i'm running ecamm live and capturing this video as well but this is a pretty good breakdown of what each application is using so obviously i'm hitting the the full machine harder on this but uh, ecamm takes up quite a bit of system resources as you can see there it's using a full core almost and probably will spike out above a full core um, so that's not something we can really pay too much attention to, but uh, the percentage of CPU of per, per core is, is interesting. So on the memory front, we're about where we were on the M1. So 2.76 gigs is what we are using right now for Logic Pro. And that's close to where we were on the M1. I will put that up here just so you can compare. Uh, I think this is a testament to how efficient Apple has uh, made Sampler and Alchemy. They're just very efficient. It'll be interesting as uh, more and more VSTs get, get ported over to the new Silicon uh, if they are able to take advantage of some of those same efficiencies or not. I'm particularly interested in uh, Superior Drummer 3. It's a memory hog, so we'll see where we land on that. But right now, bo both of these machines and both versions of Logic 
are uh, are just killing it with efficiency in terms of RAM usage. A lot of these reviews are going to be somewhat anecdotal, and this one is no exception. There's all sorts of background things happening uh, that I can't kill because this is a real-world machine that I actually use in real time. Again, I'll kind of paraphrase Renee Ritchie. I'm mostly interested in time to completion of tasks. I'm fairly blown away with what this little machine can do. I think the price of these machines, and particularly the Mini, if you're if you're getting a new uh, studio machine, it should definitely interest you. You know, it's it's a weird time. A lot of things are still being ported. We'll see if there's any issues. If it was me, I wouldn't necessarily jump into it today if I had to have a machine that works with everything that I use. That wasn't my main concern, but I will say that I'm really impressed with what it's pulling off so far. And as things get ported over, I think it's gonna be even more impressive. The way that it's handling video is pretty nuts. And I think those numbers and those anecdotal time to completion of task type tests have been the most impressive, especially on the high end of things like 8K red uh, codecs it's handling it better than some Mac Pros, which is absolutely insane, seeing as how some of those machines are 10 times the cost of one of these guys and nearly 20 times the cost of the base Mac Mini. Take that for what you will if you're balancing out all of these reviews and personal experiences. Mine is that it's pretty awesome. There are some hard limitations with what you're able to do with this machine. Uh, the M1, as far as I can understand, the hard limitation as far as RAM is 16 gigs. So if I was using this as my production machine, uh, the biggest limitation for me would be the number of monitors that I can run in a supported fashion uh, anyway off of this machine. I did try to run these two Thunderbolt displays, which are my main displays, uh, in a daisy chain thinking I could trick Apple into running two 2K monitors. And it did not like that at all. As a matter of fact, it shut right down on me and, uh, and force restarted itself, which was terrifying and interesting. It actually went into recovery mode and did a, did a rebuild of my user. So I don't suggest that you do that, but it did run one just fine. And uh, it's also run HDMI monitors just fine with a little dongle. I have a few of these little uh, USB-C dongles. This one has HDMI. And actually this is what I was just using to get uh, signal into the other machine to do this demonstration. So HDMI works great. I've also run uh, Display Link, uh, which I think has been updated for the Silicon Max now. And that works great. So ostensibly you could run two external monitors, but one would be on Display Link, which is of course gonna take a hit in terms of performance. I actually have four monitors always running on this mini. Uh, two are Thunderbolt displays and two are HDMI. But it's worth noting that those two HDMI monitors that I have going are running on an eGPU that costs more than the Mac mini. Uh, and it gives me a boost in GPU performance across the board. But this GPU performance in general blows the 2018 Mac mini away in terms of its integrated graphics performance. There's just no contest. I won't get into that too much. There are full reviews on, on how the integrated graphics of the M1 perform. And I'll just put my two cents in that it's incredible. Take that for what you will. The only concern I would have would be my third party stuff as it ports over and all those things are updated. I think this is gonna be an incredible platform to make music on. All right guys, see you next time.